Good afternoon. Hi, thanks so much for being here today. My name is Carol Lee Hutton, and I am the president and CEO of United Way Silicon Valley. And this forum that um, is taking a look at a very, very important issue is brought to you in partnership by United Way Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, and the Silicon Valley Education Foundation. And we did that because we all know how important education is. Uh, for our part at United Way, we strongly believe in the self-sufficiency of families, and we know that education is foundational to that, and so it's essential that we deal with the crisis that we have in California. So we appreciate that you've joined us today. We're gonna ask you just a few questions to get going. So how many folks in the room work in education? How many of you are, work in early education, early childhood learning? How about, how about middle grades? High school? Any post-secondary? Are there any funders in the room? No. <laughs> what we promise, we promise funders will not be descended upon. So, <laughs> uh, how about uh, community benefit organizations, nonprofits? Pretty good mix. Pretty good mix. So we. This is a. This is an interesting group. Uh, this is so important. We know how important it is. You know how important it is, or you wouldn't be here. So we're going to bring up some folks who will talk to us about each of the two propositions here, 30 and 38, and then we'll have a panel discussion that will help maybe shed a little light on this. So we hope you'll leave here uh, maybe a little bit better informed and that you'll leave here feeling very, very strongly about the need to vote on November 6th because no matter what you do, do something, right? Do something. So let's get started first by um, making sure that everyone in the room realizes that, that that tall gentleman in the black shirt in the back of the room standing behind the big thing that looks like a camera is in fact a cameraman. And that is a camera and he is representing Create TV which many of you probably know is an arm of, of uh, Comcast and the, the, the uh, community television arm in San Jose. And Create TV has graciously agreed to cover this and then to replay it so we will be able to point people to it between now and November 6th. So a lot more folks than the folks who are in the room will get the opportunity to hear what's said here today. So I just want to remind you, you're on camera. So smile. <laughs> now I want to introduce my friend and uh, community foundation colleague, Eleanor Glass. Who will, who will talk uh, just briefly about the Community Foundation. Ele Eleanor's role at the Community Foundation is community impact, grant making, and community leadership, and also donor relationships. So she doesn't have much going on. She's really, you know, that sounded to me like a pretty short, a pretty short list. But, but she is here representing today the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, which is very generously hosting us. So let me give you to Eleanor Clement Glass. Well, welcome to all of you. Welcome to our home here in Mountain View. I know for a lot of you, I heard people saying uh, that you've never been here, so welcome. Um, the work that uh, is going to happen today about Prop 30 uh, and Prop 38 and, um, is really important. We know that this is a very high stakes election. And this particular strategy of having two different tax bills <laughs> uh, you know, can confuse a lot of people. So what we're hoping today is that um, we're going to be able to learn more about the nuances of each bill, get help from our speakers in sort of sifting through some of our questions. What are the options of the impact, the implications of each of the bill? And then hopefully we'll be able to make an informed decision for our own vote, but also for our organizations as we think about um, enlarging the, the set of people that we advocate, um, who will advocate for young children. Um, I, this work is particularly important because 
in the community foundation, we intersect with many parts of the education pipeline. We work in the zero to eight category with working with families, uh, learning to talk to their kids and sort of book cuddle with them. Um, we're doing a lot of work in school readiness and um, K3 uh, alignment to um, help kids read by third grade. We have a lot of work going on um, with a lot of partners in here uh, with middle school math and closing the achievement gap there because it's still the big gatekeeper to kids either going on a college track or being pushed to the side and not having the option to go to a, a, a state college or a UC because they don't have enough credits. And we have a very large um, scholarship program that really helps uh, students pay for um, their post-secondary education. So whether they're the youngest learners or whether they're adult learners, um, we've, we've, we've got a big stake in this as well. What I'd like to f uh, close with, though, is besides learning about this and deciding what we're going to do November 6th, it's my hope that we can look beyond the election and think about implementation, that you can get to know other people who are here and know that we're all advocates here for education, for the whole pipeline. And I think that's going to be really important. No matter what happens, there's going to be a need for us to do a lot of work to keep quality education on the front burner for all people. And I hope that that's something that we'll all keep in mind. We don't have the luxury of throwing in the towel if we don't like what the results are. Um, and if we don't like the results, there's all the more reason to come together and work for young children. So I'm looking forward to this myself. Thank you. I am going to introduce our other uh, co-sponsor, Rosemary Kamei. She's from Silicon Valley Education Foundation and is the fund development director there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, at, the at the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, we are passionate about preparing students for college and careers. And we work in three arenas. We work in direct service programs, and many of you may be familiar with our programs on stepping up to algebra and stepping up to science. Uh, we also work in innovation. So uh, this year, we launched our STEM-powered website, and we hope that you uh, go to the website and take a look at all of the wonderful things that are happening uh, in STEM education. Uh, the other thing that we do is we work in policy and advocacy. So today we're absolutely delighted to be with our partners in bringing you uh, the education on uh, the Prop 30 and the Prop 38. And as been said, uh, we think that this is so critical that we want to be able to get out the information into the community, into voters, and uh, really have everyone participate. There's so much apathy out there that you know it's very, very difficult. We understand that. But that's no reason why to sit to the sidelines. We want people to participate, to vote, and to look forward uh, and do more things uh, after that. Because I think that this is not the end. This is only the beginning. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Carol Lee and uh, get started. Thank you, Rosemary. So now I get the pleasure of uh, helping us understand the details of these two propositions. And to do that, we have with us someone who spent nearly two decades at EdSource, who works as an edu education consultant, and who has taken really a great deal of time to understand these two propositions and can help us with that. So let's bring up Mary Petty to talk to us about the propositions. Thanks, Mary. Good afternoon. They've given me about 15 minutes to explain to you enough, hopefully, so that you can get grounded in these two propositions and understand them a little bit. Um, so hopefully we'll just hit the high points and you'll walk out knowing a little bit more about the basics of them before um, the panel gets started. You'll notice um, the title of my presentation is a little Dickensian. Those of us who have been involved in schools and seen what's happened to schools um, realize that that isn't too much of an exaggeration today. Um, the fact is, schools are in very bad shape right now in terms of funding. And let me give you just a quick sense of what that means. Education in California, and I'm talking about K-12 education, has been cut about 16% since 2007-8. I have data about per pupil expenditures up through 
2008-9 that gives us a national comparison. And what that data shows is that our schools spent over $2,000 less per pupil than the average state in this country. Okay, $2,000 less per pupil. So what does that mean? Well, a reality in California is that our educators' salaries are pretty high compared to the rest of the country, but comparable to other occupations that require the same level of education and experience. And that reflects the high cost of living in California. The result? We have about a third fewer adults working in our schools than is true in the rest of the country. 20 students per teacher is the average in California compared to 15.4% in the country as a whole. And that's students per teacher, not class size. Those are slightly different numbers. If you want to know more, I can tell you, but you probably shouldn't ask. Um, fewer librarians and counselors than any other state in this country by a huge margin. And another fact that I think it's really important for people to understand, we have about half as many school district administrators as the average in the U.S. Because the next comment is always, well, it's bureaucracy, right? Well, no, it's not. So, it could get worse. Without new revenue, it is certain that K-12 education in California will see more funding cuts in the current school year. Um, estimates are about $400 per student, or actually a little more than $400 per student, to just put that into perspective. So, it's up to voters. And in November, they have two options on the ballot, Proposition 30 and Proposition 38. But before I talk to you about the propositions themselves, there's a little bit more context you need in order to really get a feel for what, how they each affect education funding. The fact is, in California, state leaders control school funding. It's just the reality. About 40% of our state's general fund budget goes to Proposition 98 which is funding for K-12 and community colleges. That's the first fact you need to have in your head. The second fact is that Proposition 98 provides about 80% of all funds that go to our local schools. We have federal funds, we have some local miscellaneous, the lottery, which only accounts for less than 2%, by the way. Um, and so those also add in. But Proposition 98, which is part of the state general fund, which is controlled by state leaders, is the bulk of funding for K-12 schools. Further, the actual amount that education gets under Proposition 98, which is a minimum guarantee of funding for K-14 education, okay? There's a, that's the idea. The state has to provide at least this minimum. But the amount depends on a lot of things. It depends on the size of the state's general fund every year. And what else is happening that puts demands on state funds? Ultimately, how much education gets is a result of the actions of state lawmakers. They decide. And one of the options they have every single year is to suspend Proposition 98. It takes the two-thirds vote, but it's happened a couple times. So. That's the context for thinking about these measures. Proposition 30 is called the Schools and Local Public Safety Protection Act. Proposition 30 is Governor Brown's initiative. That's the other way you'll hear it talked about. Proposition 38, Our Children, Our Future, has been sponsored in large part by Molly Munger of the Advancement Project. The California State PTA has been an active and consistent supporter of this measure since it was first being drafted. So, I'm going to talk about Prop 30 first. Prop 30 raises income and sales taxes for a few years. What it proposes is to raise sales tax by a quarter, quarter cent, which actually doesn't even take our sales tax rate up to what it was a couple of years ago. 
And it also proposes an income tax increase only on incomes over 250000 It lasts through 2018. The revenues it'll bring in on an annual basis, about $6 billion. You'll see lots of numbers float around that are projections of what these measures will bring in. The numbers I'm going to give you here were both done at the same time. You may see other numbers, but this will give you the relative magnitude of the two measures, hopefully. Um, I saw a different number today is why I mentioned that. So um, about $6 billion. Prop 30 works within the current funding process. That means that the revenues it raises will augment the state's general fund. And per Prop 98, about 40% of the proceeds of this initiative will go to education. That means about $2.7 billion for K-12, about 300,000 for community colleges in the first year because the first year is a little bit more than $6 billion. Um, new revenues that are raised will be placed in what's called an education protection account. But there's no change in the state's obligation under Proposition 98. The other thing that this measure does is to place into the state constitution public safety funding that was a public safety funding transfer that was enacted in 2011 that moved $5 billion from the state's general fund to local governments. And those are the funds that are being used to pay for the transfer of mostly the operation of jails and prisons um, to local county governments. Okay. And so that was something that happened in the 2011 budget process, and this codifies it in the Constitution. Uh, incidentally, the courts have already said that what happened there was legitimate. So this is just like an extra seal of approval for, the, for that particular decision. Prop 38, it lasts for 12 years. The proposed tax increase is really across the board, but with a, a much heavier tax on people who make more money. And it is also, after 12 years, it would go back to the voters for renewal. The total revenues, about $10 billion. Projections are that by 2017-18, that increases to about $12.4 billion. Substantially more money, frankly. More importantly, perhaps more importantly, Proposition 38 creates a new funding source for schools. The funds are outside of the state's general fund. In, and one of the provisions in the measure is it prohibits the state from supplanting its Proposition 98 obligations with the money that would be raised through this measure. But it's important to know for the first four years, about 30% of the funds that come from this measure would be for debt repayment and would provide relief for the general fund. Part of the problem California has right now, if you think of a trajectory of income, we have a big hole in the road, okay? And Prop 30 patches over that hole. This $3 billion from Prop 38 also patches over that hole. That's the technical term for it. This creates the California Education Trust Fund, which is money that's held explicitly outside of the state budget process. The funds for education for the first few years, for the first four years, will total $7 billion, 85% for K-12 and 15% for early childhood programs. Further, Prop 38 sets up a local, local accountability system in K-12. Mandates that districts have to distribute funds directly to schools based on the students they serve and use those funds, except for a small amount, at the school site. It also sets up new accountability measures that would include site level budgeting and some other areas that provide transparency about how these funds are spent. In addition, it prohibits using the funds to increase salaries and benefits for current employees. 
couple of complicating factors. This is California school finance, so we have to have a couple of complicating factors. First of all, the state has accrued $10 billion in debt to K-12 education. It needs to settle that debt. And the, that's been done in, um, by the use of deferrals, which those of you who are involved with schools will know, have heard a lot about this. That needs to get settled. It's unclear exactly how it's going to happen. Further, the state general fund spends about $2.5 billion a year to pay back um, construction bonds for K-14 education. In the next few years, those two factors will depress the amount that actually goes from these initiatives to local schools. How that gets configured, how that happens, how each one differently interacts with those realities is really not something that's covered in the language of the initiatives themselves. Okay, That is largely going to be um, decided by the state. But Prop 38 sets aside money to specifically to cover the bond costs. And so that's, that's a very specific provision. Um, and that helps then the state general fund. It frees up other money in the state general fund. So I'm going to give you a quick side by side just to tell you what I told you. Proposition 30 versus Proposition 38. 30 raises income on the wealthiest. 38 across the board, sliding scale, 12 years. Prop 30 puts about $6 billion in the state general fund annually, compared to Prop 38, which puts $10 billion into education funding outside of the general fund, but sets aside $3 billion for the first four years. Prop 30 works within Prop 98. That means that some of the money goes to community colleges. Prop 38 works outside of Prop 98. It sets up local accountability and it earmarks funds for early childhood programs. So, worst of times, will schools at least see better times? If either of these measures pass, K-12 education will have more funding. It will benefit. If both of them pass, the highest vote getter will prevail. The provisions of whichever measure gets the larger number of votes will be put into effect. There are some details in the margin of that that no one's sure exactly how they'll get worked out, but that's the net effect. If they both pass, then the highest one wins, so to speak. I encourage you to get more information. Um, the brief you have will be posted on the Silicon Valley Ed Foundation website. And there are the websites for the other two, for the two campaign organizations. They're also in that document. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That's very helpful because this is very complicated. So now we're going to have some more folks who can talk to us about it. And that this kind of a conversation really requires a moderator. And we, and we have one of those. And I'm going to bring him up here. And I have to tell you that before I joined United Way Silicon Valley more than four years ago, I spent 30 years, my other life, in the news media business, in the newspaper business. And uh, during those 30 years, I steadfastly avoided what I thought was the hardest job in the newsroom and that was newspaper columnist, because it is a relentless beast to be fed. So it's with a great deal of respect and admiration that I bring up our moderator today, Mike Cassidy, columnist for the San Jose Mercury News, who, as you all know, regularly writes about what it is like to live here in Silicon Valley. It's all yours, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> Well, thanks, Carol Lee. That was very nice. And uh, yep, I'm the moderator. You can see they wanted to get a big, tough guy to keep everybody in line. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, I'm really happy to be here just for my own edification. Um, I, I'm kind of baffled. I, uh, propositions always baffle me because I use all these numbers. You know, there's 30, there's 38. That always bothered me. I thought they should adopt maybe like a granite. Uh, uh, gr Grand granimal theme. Anybody have those kids? <laughs> what are those things called? Gr Grand animals. 
Where, you know, if they named each one after a different animal, it'd be a lot easier to, to keep it straight. But, um, but seriously, you know, it, it is serious business, whether you're, whether you're one of the 1% or the 99% or the 47% or I guess the 53% <laughs> or some percent to be named later. You can see why all this algebra and math is so important. Um, <laughs> to figure out just where you stand in all this. But uh, we have some advocates who, uh, uh, Mary gave a really nice down the middle analysis of these two uh, propositions. And today we have a couple of advocates who, who have a perspective, opposing perspectives on this. I, I guess I can say opposing. They, I'm sure they agree on many, many things as they like to say. And uh, I'm just gonna run down um, you can see I'm very well organized because writing a column is relentless, just doesn't stop. Uh, but I was just going to run down, I won't call them rules, but the program that we're going to, we're going to have here. Um, so we have with us uh, Fred Glass, Communication Director of the San Francisco Community College Federation of Teachers, and Carol Kosovar, the President of the PTA. Um, that's the state PTA, correct? Uh, and uh, what we'll do is give each speaker, we'll, we're going to go numerically. We were going to flip a coin, but we forgot. So we'll go 30 and then 38. Um, and give each speaker seven minutes to present his or her position and uh, respond. Well, you can't really respond, but uh, present their position. And as this goes on, uh, and then after that we'll have a, a panel discussion, but as the, um, as the speakers are presenting, think about questions you might want to ask. Um, how, you know, how many times have you watched a press conference where you think, God, why doesn't a guy ask blah, blah, blah? You know, what an idiot. This is your chance to use one of those cards on your, your chair to write down a question and then I'll, I'll put it to the, uh, the panelists who will be up here a little bit later. So uh, Fred, if you're here, we'll, we'll get rolling. Thanks a lot. Did I leave anything? No. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Fred Glass. Uh, I am not actually the communications director for the San Francisco Community College District. I do teach in that district, and I am a communications director. But I'm the communications director for the California Federation of Teachers, and I'm an instructor in the San Francisco uh, Community College District. I'd like to thank the Silicon Valley Education Foundation and the Community Foundation. Could you not hear me at the back anyway? And United Way for putting this on. This is an important event. Forum, this forum and others like it represent what our electoral democracy is supposed to be about, which is an informed citizenry making educated decisions in elections, in making democracy work. Before I launch into the details of Prop 30, I want to take two brief side trips. The first is personal. My education was all public schools in California. I went through Los Angeles Unified. I got my bachelor's degree at UCLA, and my graduate work was done at San Francisco State. And since that time, I've taught in the CSU system and in the community colleges for the last 25 years. My wife, same deal. She went all through public education. She's a doctor, and she took her MD at UCSF. And my kids have gone through Berkeley Unified, and all of us have benefited from doing so greatly. The second side trip is the context of how CFT came to be involved with Prop 30. As the recession deepened in 2008 and 9, and enormous cuts that Mary outlined so well were dealt to public education, and she didn't even get to the last couple of years when things have gotten even worse. Um, CFT analyzed the situation and came up with a new strategy. And we took a chunk of the money that we usually spend on politics, meaning on ballot measures and candidates, and we set it aside for education of our members and the public. And our analysis said that what would help California at this time was more revenue. And the best way to get revenue was through a progressive tax policy, a more progressive one than we have currently in California. Progressive meaning the principle that those who can best afford to pay should pay more. Four, 
the public sector, schools, parks, roads, libraries, transportation, and assistance for the most needy. One of the first things that we did in this education program was we sponsored a march from Bakersfield to Sacramento. It took 48 days, and we talked with folks every step of the way about fair tax policies for California in a part of the state that is generally considered to be not so friendly to those ideas. And we found that that wasn't really true. We found that everywhere we went, people were telling us what we were saying made some sense. People recognized that there was growing economic inequality in California as in the nation, and that the people who have benefited most from our economy should pay a little bit more to support the common good. And we were kind of surprised and pleased to find the depth of that feeling. On the basis of that, we built a coalition in the 2010 election to pass Proposition 25. Who remembers what Proposition 25 did? Majority vote. We wanted to restore some democracy to the legislative process in Sacramento. We took the undemocratic, supermajority, two-thirds requirement for passing a state budget whereby a minority held the majority hostage each year, and we reduced that to a simple majority. And people said it couldn't be done, and we did it. Governor Brown was elected in that same moment. He thought he would get some tax extensions to help out California's schools and services from reasonable conversations with a few reasonable Republican legislators. My, how times had changed since the last time he was governor. There was no possibility of a legislative solution to address the revenue problem because all the Republicans had taken a no new taxes pledge and they refused to a person. So we understood that. We started doing the most serious research that we had ever done, taking that money that we had previously spent in other ways into opinion research to figure out what would work on the ballot for revenue. The first thing we came up with that the public was wildly enthusiastic about was the idea about 1% on the 1%. And we got statewide headlines with this polling and found that 75% and more of the public, 78%, was in favor of a 1% on the 1%, 60% of Republicans were for it. 43% of people who have self-identified as 1%ers in this poll were for it. So people recognized that there was a problem here and that there was a way to deal with it. But as we did our research, we evolved three principles that made us change our mind about doing a ballot measure on the 1% one on the 1%. Three-part principle. We needed to raise the most money possible for education and services. And prop is that how much I have left? OK. Um, in conclusion, <laughs> uh, we needed to raise the, as much money as possible with the most progressive tax possible, and according to our research, the tax that was most winnable. So we merged our measure eventually with the governors. We had the millionaire's tax. And we were going to win if we could get to the finish line. But he had the resources. We had the message. We came together and we merged what we were going to do. This will raise nine billion, some people say eight, in the first year, and six billion for six more years after that, which I call several years, not a few. It will raise revenue by increasing taxes on the wealthy. Nobody under 250K a year will pay a penny in income taxes, and will have a very small increase in the state sales tax of one quarter of 1%. 80 to 90% of this revenue will come from a progressive source. It will also set into the state constitution the financial arrangements made in last year and this year's budget for realignment. It's not going to put money into that. The money for this goes into education and the general fund. The realignment has already been done. That's separate from the general fund. What this will not do is solve all of California's budget problems. We have a systemic chronic budget gap of 10 to $12 billion a year. This will get us halfway to solving the problem. There will still be more work to do. We believe Prop 30 has the best chance of winning by the polling. It has been out in front well over 50% from the very beginning. And what we want to do above all is win this and make money happen for the schools. Let me close with the words of Frank Jernigan who is a Google software engineer who was part of the company from the beginning and overnight when the company went public became uh, very well to do. He said, for me, an extra two or three percent in taxes is not going to make a bit of difference in the way that I live. 
but by bringing billions of dollars in new revenues to California for public schools and services, Prop 30 will make a tremendous difference in the lives of many. Thank you. Yes, the ceremonial passing of the mic. Great. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Carol Koshavar, uh, who will uh, who will talk about the Munger proposition, as I like to call it, because it's not a number. <laughs> Is Carol here? Yes. Oh, yes. sorry. I was watching. <laughs> Come on down, as they say on uh, whatever that inane show is. <laughs> can you do this? What do I do with it? Do you can clip that on your lapel. Maybe a little higher. Wait, it's backwards. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm really, really pleased to be here um, to talk about the PTA initiative. Um, I want you to, to close your eyes for a minute and, and just imagine. Imagine a kindergarten class small enough so the teacher can meet the individual needs of each student. Imagine an elementary school with a librarian. Imagine a middle school that teaches art and music. A high school that actually has enough counselors to help our children understand what courses they need to take to get into college. Imagine restoring the instructional time that has been cut from our schools. That's what's going to happen when Proposition 38 passes. And that's why the California State PTA is proud to have helped write Proposition 38 to restore funding for schools, every single school in California. We've done polls. Parents throughout California have told us one very clear message. Adequate funding for our schools is the number one priority. And adequate funding for our schools that restores a complete quality education for every single child in California. We're at a crossroad. It's time to stop engaging parents and communities in these heartbreaking decisions about what to cut out of our schools. And it is time to start engaging parents and communities in the important decisions on what are we going to restore at every single school in California. And that's what this is about. Proposition 38 guarantees billions of dollars every single year, averaging $10 billion annually over a 12-year period that will go to every single public school in California directly based on the number of kids that are at that school. Let me repeat that. New money for every school, guaranteed. Proposition 38 is, is clear, it's straightforward, and it creates real accountability. And it ensures the money is going to be spent on the educational programs and services that our kids need. It guarantees local control and requires input from parents and teachers to help decide how the money is going to be spent at that school. Last year, the PTA was very, very concerned, just like the CFT and everyone who is involved in education, about the terrible decimating cuts that have occurred to our schools. And we went and talked to all kinds of folks about what do we need to do to start to restore the programs and services that our kids need. And we actually sat down with the Advancement Project and helped write the language in Proposition 38. And some of the things that are in Proposition 38 are what our parents have told us they want, what our parents have told us they want to see. So when I talk about local control and local accountability, that's straight from parents. They want to be involved in those decisions because people in our local communities 
know our local schools the best. And when Mary spoke about how Proposition 38 is a different way of funding schools, it is a different way of funding schools. It is a funding mechanism that says we are taking additional money that we are raising, we are going to send it straight to our local communities, and our local communities, not Sacramento, will make those important decisions on what will, we will have or what we won't have in our schools. Those are decisions that are made by our school boards, but those are decisions that require the input of our local parents and local teachers. Now, our children really deserve something more than just preventing more cuts to schools. They deserve something more than a new normal that keeps California at the bottom 47th in the nation. What Proposition 38 is, is a vision. It is a vision for restoring funding for our schools. It starts to restore the California dream of a high quality education for every single child. And it starts to restore funding for schools as the top priority for our state. And not only does it restore funding for our K through 12, it makes significant investment in early childhood education because we know that if we start early, we can help our children succeed and we can start to address that achievement gap that we all want to close. And it significantly, significantly closes the budget deficit by raising $3 billion a year for four years, $12 billion, money that goes to pay for facility bond debt, but frees up money on the general fund side, money that the legislature can decide to use for CSU, for higher education. That's a decision up to them, but it significantly frees up money on the general fund side so that we can start to look at those issues too. So let's talk one minute about how do we pay for it. It's paid for by a sliding scale income tax. And the independent legislative analyst has told us that because of tax credits, 60% of our taxpayers pay additional taxes. 40% of our taxpayers do not have an increase in the taxes because the existing tax credits wipes out those liabilities. Parents and communities, I know people here understand the importance of investing in our children. Everyone benefits, our children, our state, our nation. And the question California voters need to decide is this. Do we continue, do we continue to deny an entire generation of children the quality education they deserve right now? Or do we take that bold step and support Proposition 38? Start to have a new funding stream that will guarantee money directly to every single public school in California. We believe it's time to take that step, and that's why the California State PTA has taken, I believe, a very dramatic step in helping to write and go out and support an initiative that will actually transform funding for California so that we have children and parents and communities who are qualified and able to have a quality education. And she said, stop, and I did. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, very good. So now, now what are we gonna do? Those are two excellent <laughs> presentations. Um, so we're gonna move into our, our panelist segment, but before, uh, before I do that, one quick announcement, those brilliant questions that you're writing down, if when you've uh, finished, you know, you can revise, but uh, if you'll pass them towards the middle, Bob Nichols will pick them up. Do you have a regular schedule, Bob, or you just... Uh... Okay, so Bob's the guy to uh, see or look for for that. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm actually going to invite the two presenters up also uh, in case they have anything else to say. I can't imagine they would, but... Uh, so uh, both Fred and Carol will be part of our panel, and then I will introduce the other panelists, and I think... Um, since we don't have name tags, if, you don't, if it's not too goofy, how about I'll say your name and then you can come up. Maybe it's kind of dramatic, actually. <laughs> it's sort of the NBA model. Um, so, uh, so Fred and Carol, if you'll come on up, everybody knows you. Thank you. 
Uh, and we have uh, Joan Barham, President of the Board of Trustees of Foothill De Anza. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, we also have Jessica Mahaley, who is from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation right here at home and as a specialist in pre-K through third grade education, among other things, I'm sure. Uh, Mary, are you going to join us? No. Yes. No? Oh, Jan Christensen. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I had underlined your name, but the way I did it, put a line right through it. Jan is the <laughs> superintendent of the Redwood City Schools. So that's uh, certainly an interesting perspective. And I'm Mike Cassidy. And just to make this all the more comfortable for everyone on the panel, uh, because of the television camera, it would be very helpful if you could stand while you're talking. It, talk about school. This is old school. You know, as you answer your question, you will stand up. Um, and we actually have two mics for you guys, I guess. So I'll place this here. Sorry to walk in front of everybody. And they're strategically placed. And uh, we were going to begin by taking, uh, you guys will have to sit on your hands for a moment, but the, the other panelists, if we could each take three minutes to uh, respond to what you've heard or, or um, expound on it, if that's okay. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm so why don't we just go down this way? Yes, please. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and the other sponsors. Uh, we are a recipient in Redwood City of grants from the foundation, so that does help in our situation. So I'm Jan Christensen, superintendent of Redwood City Elementary School District. We are a pre-K through eighth grade district in San Mateo County. We are also one of the lower revenue limit districts that in terms of funding and how we feed into the Sequoia Union District. So we like to say that um, the child from Woodside versus our, the child from Redwood City, who will sit next to each other in ninth grade, the Woodside child will have about $100,000 more invested in their education by the time they finish eighth grade. And so um, just to say any additional revenue, of course, is something we support in Redwood City, I support. Um, in terms of reaction to what I heard, um, first of all, Proposition 30, the governor's proposition, both propositions actually were supported by the California School Boards Association and our board in Redwood City supported both of them. In terms of Proposition 30, uh, if that does not pass, I think we as superintendents are looking at what are the repercussions. So in Redwood City, due to negotiating with our teachers, we will take 13 furlough days. So that's 13 fewer days of school. And we're a district of approximately 9,600 children, 70% Latino, 50% English language learners, uh, over that percentage of students that are on free and reduced lunch. We've already cut summer school. We have 31 children K through eight in our classrooms now. And in spite of that, due to the extremely hard work of our teachers and our leaders, our test scores have all gone up, even in spite of that. And I've been superintendent since 06, and I've cut every single year, except that very first year I was a superintendent. So, so that is an issue, that a challenge that we're facing. So we currently have deferrals from the state, so we take out loans to pay our bills and pay our salaries. 25 million this year we're getting loans on to pay deferrals. So, you know, when I look at uh, Proposition 30, it, the impact certainly would be beneficial if it passes for education, and particularly in our, in our sense. With Proposition 38, it would absolutely provide additional revenue to our schools. Um, I think the devil is probably in the details, and that and since it goes directly to school sites, would that in fact still um, ensure that the trigger that the governor is saying he's going to pull, which is the cuts to revenue to us from Prop 98, still equal those 13 days. So would the sites have, would I have 16 different sites deciding whether they put that money into extending the days or not? But clearly, that proposition does provide additional revenue for our, our schools, and we need that desperately. 
And I think it's just a real testament to the efforts on both of these people here today advocating that you know, understand that we desperately need additional funding. And it's, I believe, criminal, the funding situation in California. So I hope that uh, one or both or something happens that we get more revenue. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for including early childhood education in your considerations today. We know from research that uh, early childhood investments are the wisest investment, the ones with the highest return on investment, which is why I'm so happy to hear Jan refer to her district as a pre-K to, to eight district, because many of our districts in the state include child care and early childhood programs, and it's new that the districts are starting to really include them in their, their thinking. Um, we, in the state, actually have a very strong infrastructure in early childhood education going back, you may not know, to World War II and Rosie the Riveter when women going back to the workforce needed childcare. However, in the past few years, there have been devastating cuts, as is true for K-12. Early childhood has taken a, a cuts of about a billion dollars in the last, since, since 2008, which amounts to about 114,000 fewer children a year receiving early childhood services. Um, the propositions that are in front of us, uh, I, I really am not going to take a position on either one, but I'll tell you a little bit about my understanding of their impact on early childhood education. Proposition 30 doesn't address early childhood directly. Uh, if the proposition doesn't pass and there are trigger cuts, um, there will be significant impacts to education overall. The impacts to higher education also affect the early childhood field significantly because the, pro the majority of our workforce is trained in community colleges uh, and in the CSU system. Also, cuts to K-12 are very devastating to children who've come, obviously, from early childhood. And a lot of the work in the early childhood field in this era and in our at the Community Foundation is focused on the transition to K-12 and really taking advantage of those major investments that have been made in the early years by ensuring that children are transitioning into a strong, developmentally appropriate system. So we don't want to see the dismantling of the good programs that exist in K-12. Prop 38 um, is reflective of the fact that Molly Munger and her compatriots are have been steeped in the early childhood world for the past few years and really have listened to some of the challenges that, have occur, that, that occur in the early childhood system. So, um, for example, and, and significantly, 15% of the funding in Prop 38 for education is set aside for early childhood programs. 75% of that funding would go to serve children in preschool years, and then the remaining 25% for infant toddler care. So that's one of the areas that's been cut dramatically over the years is the infant toddler piece. And again, in terms of return on investment, the, the graphs that we see show that the, the investment, the earlier it's made, the, the steeper the return. So it's very significant that there's an infant toddler set aside. In addition, um, there is a stipulation that, that some of the spaces for childcare be full day and full year, which is another significant um, acknowledgement of a challenge that many of the ex remaining preschool spaces in the state are part day and do not serve the needs of working families. Uh, a priority for the funds in Prop 38 would be to serve the lowest income children and that has certainly been a priority at the Community Foundation and among first five programs that fund early learning as well so we, we applaud that. Um, there is also in Prop 38 funding for quality that goes towards beefing up licensing. There have been, there have been scary, scary cuts to the amounts of visits that are made by social services to check in on pre preschool and daycare programs to make sure they're providing high quality, safe care for children. Uh, there's also funding for a database, which for some of you may not sound exciting, but for those of us in the field is like, yes, a, a real database that tracks children from early on and then tracks them, follows them into the K-12 system so that we can understand the kinds of interventions that really work for young kids. And lastly, there's a significant amount of money set aside. The, the estimate is $40 million for a quality rating and improvement system, which helps um, parents and providers understand the quality of the program and helps them to increase uh, the quality of the programs that are being provided. 
Um, as Jan said, her board and the state board have taken a position to support both uh, initiatives. And from what I'm hearing, that's true of many early childhood advocates, commission, first five commissions. Those that are taking a position are, are supporting both. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I feel a little like the skunk at the garden party because I'm the only one who can't stand up and say, vote for both of these, they're both good for us. Um, you heard from Mary a lot about K-12 schools, a little less about higher education. Uh, community colleges have also been uh, cut dr drastically over the last few years. Uh, statewide, 12% in four years. Our own district, 15% in the last four years. Um, and fees have gone up. I'm sure any of you who have students who are going to community colleges or might be taking classes yourself, fees have gone up just in those four years from $26 a unit to $46 a unit. And if Proposition 30 does not pass, community colleges will be cut by another $338 million or 7%, and they will be cut in the middle of the academic year. Um, Proposition 38 gives nothing to community colleges or any of higher education. So if Proposition 38 passes with more votes than Proposition 30, or if both of them fail, we'll see the, see the same result. Um, I told you th 338 million statewide, which translates to about 180,000 fewer students who would be funded, because we don't fund every student who shows up for community colleges. We fund, we are told how many students we will be paid to educate, and so if there's less money, you simply can serve fewer students. I looked at it for the uh, districts within Silicon Valley, for Foothill De Anza, our own, my own district. It would be nine and a half million dollars less for San Jose Evergreen, four and a half million dollars. For West Valley Mission, five and a quarter million. For Ohlone, two and a half million. For Chabot Las Positas, over five million. I figured those were the Silicon Valley districts. If you add those all up, that's 27 million dollars less in community colleges, or probably 12 to 15,000 fewer students who would be funded. Uh, the state has budgeted assuming that 30 will pass, but we have built our budgets assuming that 30 will fail because we have to, because if it doesn't pass, we'll have this nine in our district, $9 million cut. Now, why is that a problem for those of you who are not community college students or don't have students in community colleges? 70% uh, of our state's nurses are trained in community colleges. 80% of firefighters, law enforcement personnel, and emergency <laughs> medical personnel are technicians are trained in community colleges. In the UC system, 28% and 55% of CSU graduates start at the community college. And 50% of all veterans who are taking advantage of the GI Bill to get further education or job training do it at community colleges. All of these programs would have to be cut back, would be threatened. Since Proposition 38 uh, would provide support only for specific purposes, uh, which are wonderful purposes, K-12 and child care and preschool, which we all support, but lawmakers would, could not use the measure's revenues to restore cuts to other key priorities or higher education. And without significant new general fund revenues, policymakers may have to make even deeper cuts to bring the state's budget into balance in future years. And the state's colleges and universities and obviously community colleges would be targeted for further cuts. And so while I feel uncomfortable, normally we're in the Proposition 98 pot with all of uh, K-12 schools, but in this case, the uh, PTA initiative has not included K, uh, community colleges. And so for community colleges, whether Proposition 38 passes or fails is, has nothing to do with us. It will be cuts to community colleges unless Proposition 30 passes with more votes than Proposition 38. Well, uh, thank you. I guess I guess I better stand up too if I'm going to make everybody stand up. But um, 
That's, uh, th that's really quite a, quite a range of, of thought, and I can't say I feel much better after hearing it all. <laughs> but um, I, th I thought I'd ask, uh, start with a general question, maybe, maybe for our proposition advocates especially, but it, this idea of having these two, com well, what, what many think of as competing propositions, um, does that have you worried that they both may fail? And why wasn't there a way to, to maybe get everybody on the same team and come up with a proposition? We if you don't did mind standing, that'd be great. Thanks. Well, like I said in my presentation, we did merge our measure with the governor's. Part of our thinking was that it would be better to have fewer rather than more on the ballot because with more, there's the possibility of a broad ranging, um, thought widening discussion on the issues, and there's also the possibility of some bitterness, competition, and confusion. And so we thought it was a good idea to try and narrow down the choices. So, Carol? Uh... Well, um, I guess a part of the answer is that, you know, California is a large state. And we are large enough to have differing ideas on how to invest in our schools in our future. And I think as you've listened to what both of these initiatives do, they do things that are very different. And we felt that it was important for the people of California to look at both of these and try to decide what path they wanted to take. I think all of us, everyone in this room, cares deeply about public education. And we all want additional revenues. The biggest question is, are we, wh how are we going to spend them? Is it a long-term restoration of the cuts? I think that's the kind of conversation and thought we have to have about it. And if I, I can for a second, um, I think we all care about community colleges. We all care about higher education. And that's one of the reasons that you might have noticed that there were two versions of uh, our initiative. Our initiative, when it was first written, was really only written for K-12 and early child care. And then we looked at it again, and we said, you know what? There are these issues in the general fund that should be uh, looked at. And so what we did is we actually filed a, a second initiative, and the second initiative says that because we raise $10 billion a year, we can take $3 billion out of that and start to use that as budget and deficit relief. And when we use that money to pay for the school facility bonds, what that does is it frees up a like amount of money in the general fund budget, and the legislature can decide how it wants to use that money. Uh, those are those decisions that the legislature can, because we, we clearly recognize the importance. Uh, PTA has always stood for you know, supporting children, needy children, welfare, all of those things. And we wanted to make sure if we were going to raise $10 billion that we can have some of that money during this time when our economy is starting to rebound to address that significant issue. So I just wanted to know that that, that was that was purposeful. You know, although you're literally standing, uh, let me keep you in the hot seat for a second because a member of the audience <laughs> had a question which you were very, very close to answering, but wh why did the state PTA leave out their Prop 98 partners, the community colleges, from Prop 38 funding? I, I guess, was there a specific? There wasn't a purposeful, um, we're gonna leave them out. Um, what, what we were thinking about, and I think it was addressed when we we talked about the early childhood um, portion uh, was the tremendous need to invest in early childhood because we know that if we have children that start early, um, they're ready for K-12 and then they are ready for community college and universities. And part of the thought process is that we have children who are better prepared you know as well as I do that some of our community colleges and our universities, there's a lot of remedial work that's being done. If we can have children who are ready and, and prepared, that's something that could be addressed early by 
uh, having youngsters in, in early preschool and, and early childhood. I wonder, I might throw this out to, oh, did you have a comment on that? I'm disappointed that we don't have some of the other uh, services, state services represented here too, because it isn't just higher education that will lose out or be left in the very, in the California budget that we're all so unhappy with. It's public safety, it's health and human services, it's everything else except K-12 and preschool education that will be left to fight over what's left in uh, Prop 98 will still have 40% of that general fund, but everything that would come in from Prop 38, if it were to pass with more votes, would not even be considered. It would be over and above in this separate pot. And so it really does severely impact everything else in the state budget, not just community colleges, which is I'm the only one represented on the panel, but we might have had UC, CSU, public safety, transportation, everybody else who is looking for those state funds okay. here to defend their position also. Good point. I think Fred had something to say, and then I'll try to throw it open. Yeah, actually, this is why we constructed this, our Prop 30 the way we did, because CFT, our members are in the classroom every day. I'm in the classroom in a community college, actually, San Francisco City College, and I see the effects of the cuts on my students. They're dreams deferred, the fact that they have to pay more and more money for something that should be free, that was free when I went to school. It was practically free to go to UCLA, and community colleges were free until just a few years ago. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's an investment in our future. I had four students in my community college class last year from San Francisco State because they couldn't get the classes that they needed because there had been so many cuts of sections. So that's the kind of thing that we face and is going on. Prop 98 is very complex. I don't pretend to be able to understand it fully, but I can tell you this, that Prop 30 was designed to put the money into 98 to raise the floor, which means that each year going forward, there will be an increased amount of base funding for Prop 98. That was very important, the way education funding works in this state. And the rest of the money goes into the general fund. The general fund is four things. It's K-12 and community college, that's Prop 98, 40%. It's about 30%, a little more, into social services, around 10% into higher ed, CSU and UC, and 10% into corrections, roughly. What we believe in in CFT is that when a child comes to our classroom or an adult comes into our classroom, if they come to school sick, or hungry or homeless, they're not gonna get a very good education. That's why we designed the rest of the money to go into the rest of the general fund because we want to be helping out with all of those parts of the budget and all of the needs of the people in California. Thanks, so, so let me ask this. There, there probably aren't all that many families that have a kid in preschool and one in college, but you know, could, could be, and certainly extended families. But with these two propositions, and they're, you can't quite stretch them to cover the whole thing. What are, what are voters supposed to do who are looking out not just for their own families, but who really want to improve education from the very beginning until, uh, you know, at least through a college education? Just jump right in. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what I would say is that Proposition 30 is an attempt to help the whole state budget, to grow the whole state budget. Uh, so that it will help everybody at every level, in school, out of school. Uh-huh. And what, uh, Carol, I guess? Well, uh, the PTA actually has a neutral position on Proposition 30, uh, but uh, I just wanted to go back a little bit on the budget relief that Proposition 38 provides, because not only does it provide um, significant budget relief for the first four years, but over the lifetime of Proposition 38, it continues to provide uh, general fund budget relief. Um, it's a little intricate. Uh, there's a something called a smoothing effect in the Proposition 38, and essentially what it means is that we try to keep the income steady uh, that goes to the school. So if there are blips in the income, um, some of that money then goes, and the independent legislative analyst estimates it's in the millions and millions of dollars as time goes out to help the general fund. 
So there is continual support uh, by that debt payment of general fund relief throughout it, which is as significant as in Prop 30. Let me, uh, let me just read a couple of comments that came up. They're not questions, but I'm trying to make this like Twitter, but with little cardboard <laughs> things. You don't have to worry with the hashtags and all that. Oh, yes, of course. Take your own medicine. If people who want more funding for education vote for their favorite Proposition 30 or 38, and people opposed to taxes vote against both Proposition 30 and 38, then both props will lose by a wide margin. So the only reasonable strategy is to vote for both. Maybe an answer to my question, I don't know. Uh, the other, oh, I wanted to read this because it has a technical education term in it. I like, uh, regarding Prop 38, I like the revenue picture, but I'm concerned about the concept of, quote, local accountability. Having sat on a site-based council for two years with school budget oversight, I can tell you the process was extremely loosey-goosey. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear from Jan. Let's have Jan go, and then, then you can go. Well, I think that um, in terms of the loosey-goosey comment there, um, there is some um, concern with that you're going to end up with a wide range that each site council would be doing vastly different things. On the other hand, there are ways that you can put some uh, measures um, at the local level to deal with that. We just passed a parcel tax, a very little one, and, and actually all of the money is going directly to each site, and the site council has to fill out a similar to a grant application, mm. bring it to me to see that it matches the ballot language, and then it also goes to the board for approval, and then also to the um, uh, to our citizens oversight committee will look to make sure that they spent the money in alignment with the ballot So I I think it can be done. I think the bigger concern from superintendents that I've talked to is that um, if we're faced with tremendous cuts because if there's more voters for that particular proposal 38 and we still have the trigger will all of the sites still agree to first fund the schools for the, for a full school year before other things are done. So that's where I, I don't know what all the details would be in the impact. Does, uh, does, it, does anybody know the answer to that? Someone from the audience was asking whether the, the trigger, oh, I promised you uh, oh. a response to the last well, thing. It's, it's sort of an answer. <laughs> uh, there has been some discussion, and I think Superintendent, oh, Superintendent of Instruction Torlakson said yesterday or the day before uh, about the trigger cuts. The, the budget is based on Proposition 30 and the numbers in Proposition 30. It's not based on the numbers in Proposition 38. So when Proposition 38 passes, Proposition 38 actually has money that will go for the general fund and it will have money that will go for education. And the the thought process that I've heard from a number of people is it will be a game changer. It will be, okay, we had thought that we were basing it on 30. Now we have this different set of revenues. We're gonna have to come together as a legislature and say, now what do we do? And the other thing that we'll have, which I hope, we will have the people of California saying, we want to restore funding for our schools. We will have a very, very strong mandate that says we believe we need to restore funding for our schools. And so our elected officials will have that as a very strong guideline as to how they decide how to cover that time period, knowing that there is money in the general fund and knowing that there quickly is a lot of money uh, to restore those programs and services. Okay, thank you. So the uh, next tweet, uh, Prop 30, doesn't this simply throw more money into a dysfunctional system where money will flow to prisons, growing pension obligations, and high -speed rail, the high-speed rail project? Proposition 38, not off the hook. Unemployment remains high, and even a small income tax increase can create a challenge for those living on the edge, still paying boom your mortgages and such. What is your response to those thoughts, which I'm sure you've heard on both the 30 and 38 side? The measure of the effectiveness of our government usually comes in direct proportion to the level of citizen involvement in the political process. 
And if we continue to have a process in California in which the vast majority of people don't really participate, even to the point of voting, but beyond that, being involved in discussions like this, going out there and advocating, going door to door, going precinct walking, phone banking, and so on, then we kind of get what we deserve as a democracy. So I suggest that if you care about the money that goes into the programs that they're supposed to, that you be out there talking to your legislators, knocking on their doors, and making sure that the money goes where it's supposed to go. Because believe me, there are other people that will do that, and they may not agree with you. I think that's great advice, that knocking on the door thing doesn't always go well. But, oh, you mean their office door? Yes, yes certainly. Okay. I'm going to have to go get a cough drop. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I, I'm just looking over some of the information. If you don't mind standing. Sorry. Okay, I have to admit to certain Thanks. not being an expert. But as I understand it, this bond repayment, which does help to um, relieve the general fund for three years, and only for three years, and after that, or four years, and only for four years. After that, the money that comes in from Proposition 38 is allocated 85% to K-12 and 15% to preschool education. And so the state is in, is and the state has its full Prop 98 responsibilities still, which in my case is good for community colleges. Mm -hmm. We'll get our 11% of the 40%. But it doesn't really help with the state's budget deficit at all. It is a separate fund set aside, sent, and we love that, sent to what we agree, we all agree is the most important thing that uh, state tax dollars do. But it really is not a way to deal at all with the state's budget deficit. Joan, you have special dispensation. You may sit when you answer because uh, otherwise you get blasted with the, the light. And you're in the aisle, so thank you. W were you going to add to that? or No, please. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, well, so, w you know, one thing, very honestly, that I've been wondering about is the, the revenue from Prop 38. M maybe, Jan, you could answer this. Um, so there was language about not paying for salaries, although I think it said of existing school employees or something. I'm trying to figure out, can that money be used for salaries? Well, what I, I'm supposed to stand, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what I understand is you can use money for new employees because if you're going to get this infusion of revenue, which so, we so desperately need, we would be hiring librarians. And I have one counselor for 9,000 600 children, so it would be helpful to be able to add some counselors in and services back that we've lost, or, or teachers, absolutely, to reduce our class sizes um, from 31 down to more reasonable levels. So my understanding is you could use it for that, um, not for salary increases, like for wages. That's what I've heard, so. The, the idea was, the idea was that if we were if if we were going to raise a significant amount of money, we wanted to make sure that that money was used to start to restore the programs and services at the school site. So we didn't want to have a situation where you raised a significant amount of money and it all went on the table for bargaining. We wanted to make sure that the money was used to pay the salaries for people to do the jobs that are so important in the classrooms. So, uh, so Fred, um, you, you know, things are said in political campaigns, and one of the points that's been brought up is that the unions are supporting um, 30 because th that money can go for salaries. Um, is that, I mean, can you address that? No, the unions are supporting 30 because the governor is very persuasive. We tried to get the governor, and we tried to get the unions to work with us. And since the competition with us was the governor, the other unions went with the governor. He has a lot of power. He has a lot of sway. He is in charge of the government. That means a lot. So no, I, I mean, of course, any union advocates for its members. But that's not all we advocate for. We advocate every year 
for we belong to the labor movement. We advocate for the minimum wage being raised. That doesn't affect our members. We advocate on the basis of our principles that this is a society we want to be able to live in. In order to do that, we have to adequately fund all social services. And so if some of the money is going to do that and help out people who need it, you know, that's just part of the game. And, and our salaries may not be as high as they could be as a result. That's all right. We'll continue to advocate for our salaries, too. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to be clear time, that um, this had nothing to do with whether or not what, what salaries people should be earning. I mean, everyone believes that people should be earning a, a, a salary that meets what they're doing. Um, the whole idea was that if we were going to be raising money, we wanted to be able to use it to start to restore those programs and services. I've got a, a question here that I think might, you know, might reflect the thoughts of uh, maybe not a lot of people in this room, but I think probably a lot of voters. Uh, what, what are Californians paying for that other states are not? I've lived in five other states. All have lower sales and income taxes, but spend more per child on education. Is it, uh, does anyone want to take it? Is it that we're spending? Sorry, I was whispering to Carol. I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> uh, uh, someone in the audience I... was wondering uh, what it is that California is spending on more because. Uh, sure, sure. So California actually spends less of its um, total income, if you will, on education than is true in most other states. One of the, if you, especially if you look at it on a per pupil basis, one of the realities is we have more children per wage earner, if you will, than is true in many other states. So that's one element of that. We have one of the lowest property tax rates in the country. And in most other parts of the country, property taxes are the primary source of, or, or a much more substantial source of education funding than is true in California. We also have an expensive place to live here. And so we have this issue of people costing more, and education is a people business. About 80 to 85 percent of expenditures for schools go to salaries and benefits for people. So all of those things combined create really a perfect storm in California in terms of the way that we support our schools. Thank you. That, that's very helpful, I think. Uh, apparently, we have time for one more question. And this is one that a number of people in the audience had asked. Uh, uh, I'll let anyone jump in here. Does, does funding go to all K through 12 schools under both propositions, or does one or both prioritize schools in lower income communities? That's a, a question I, I'm glad you asked because one of the things that most people haven't known about Proposition 38 is that it very clearly provides additional funding for youngsters who are poor. The money that goes for Proposition 38 goes for every child in every school. But if a child is eligible for free lunch, additional money follows that child to that school. This is very important. Those are youngsters who need additional support. And we believe this is a direct way to provide that help for our most needy children, and it was purposely written that way. That's true, and that's a good thing about Prop 38. What Prop 30 does is by putting money into social services, it comes at the same problem from a different angle. As I said, um, we have a 10 to $12 billion budget deficit moving forward each year. You should check out the California Budget Project website, which has a lot of really good charts on this kind of thing. One of its charts shows how every year from 1991 until the passage of Prop 25 in 2010, as part of the budget deal at the end of the game and the hostage taking, the state of California let go of or eliminated or reduced a tax or fee. 
That's where that 10 to $12 billion deficit came from. So that needs to be addressed going forward. 38 addresses it partially. 30 addresses it partially. Whichever one passes this November, and I do hope that it's Prop 30, we're gonna have more work to do. We will need to look at Prop 13 and some pieces of it like split roll. And we will need to look at the piece of it that put the two thirds in place, the undemocratic two thirds to pass a tax in the California state legislature. Then we wouldn't have ballot box budgeting at that point. Whatever happens this fall, we'll still have a lot of work to do going forward. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're just about out of time for this portion of our program, but uh, don't forget to vote. Uh, it's the giraffe versus the elephant. Take your pick. Well, how about a round? Yeah. Okay, I, I really want to thank all of the panelists and uh, Mike Cassidy. This was a great discussion. I learned several things today that I didn't know. I hope that, um, that you, I see Dana back there nodding her head that she learned something too. And if we taught Dana Bunnett something, then I feel really good about this forum, I'm telling you. Uh, this was really uh, educational. And uh, if, if nothing else, it reinforces that we need to do something because what we heard up there really reinforces that we must act. We need to do something on November 6th. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to our moderator. On behalf of United Way Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, and the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, thanks to all of you for coming out and, and taking part and for the great questions that the audience generated. Have a great evening and vote on November 6th.